Next time you look at memory prices and mourn how expensive they are, just think to yourself how hard it is for the memory suppliers. One of them recently told me, off the record, we're making more money than ever. So, I mean, based on that statement alone, it's really hard for them right now. And looking at a stock chart, for example, for one of the major memory suppliers would definitely not make it look like they're making boatloads of money despite the shortage, as they claim. So uh, we're going to be talking about memory prices a little bit today. We have another content piece that will talk about them in a lot more detail. This is all independent GN research or GN exclusive information we've retrieved. And you'll want to subscribe and make sure you catch that follow-up content. Otherwise, we're talking about some AMD information, including some AMD information we received as well. And, uh, and then we've got some discussion about case design once again. Before that, this video is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly, makers of the Conductonaut liquid metal that we recently used to drop 20 degrees off of our temperatures. Thermal Grizzly also makes traditional thermal compounds for use on top of the IHS, like cryonaut and hydronaut pastes. Learn more at the link below. So first, a quick update on the mod mats. This is actually like a, a good weapon this size. Uh, mod mat stuff, this is really cool. So we're learning more and more about manufacturing as we go. The newest thing we've learned is that we can make some tooling now. So we're starting to do enough volume with the factory where we can basically make some custom tooling for the cut. So cutting the mat now will be semi-automated rather than 100% by hand. And that means a lot of things for us. One of them presently, I am hand sorting a lot of the mats when we get them in. So for quality control purposes, I'm actually still looking at 40 to 60% of the mats personally. Roll them out, look at them, make sure everything looks perfect. And then we roll it back up, ship it out, and I autograph a bunch of those in the process for people who buy the signed ones. But the point is that now when doing quality control, we know that all of the mats are going through the same tooling. And this is kind of the same thing that I'll say big or real manufacturers do when they do things like case tooling or whatever. Because as you invest more and more into your tooling, you can reduce production time and it hopefully increase quality. Definitely in our case, increase quality. We're also doing some custom stuff for the print. So the print should be more automated now and super accurate. We're investing in that tooling for the, uh, for the mat cut and for the printing process. So it's more investment on our front, but it definitely will pay off. And it means we have a higher quality product, which is already super high quality. So really happy about all this. It's, uh, as I said previously, this is a huge learning experience for us because product manufacturing is giving me personally a, a very new angle for when I look at products review because I understand the things that manufacturers go through. I understand the tooling cost and the trade-offs they make where you're basically committing to making these things for a long time because you've just spent money on tooling and stuff like that. Uh, also, all the mats for the previous run should have shipped out by now if they have shipped out by now. If you're in the US, you most likely have yours. If you're not, give it a bit more time. It's shipping international. Uh, otherwise, email support at gamersnexus.net if you have any questions about an existing order or if you'd like to place an order and you just have some questions about the mat and how it works or whatever, and we'll help you out. We're very focused on support. I've hired someone to specifically help with support. So it's just support at gamersnexus.net. If you have any questions, send them there. He'll help you out. And uh, we are very seriously making sure that our support process is good because I know one of the things that pisses me off with companies whose products we review is support. So I don't want to fall into that trap and we're taking it seriously. If you like what you see and you want one of the GN anti-static mod mats, make sure you back order now because we keep selling through them every time more come in. Go to store.gamersnexus.net. If you back order now, we'll definitely get you in for the next production run. Uh, but that should remain true for a bit longer because this week we are in uh, finalizing cutting. Next week we're doing printing and then we'll start shipping process within the next five weeks or so. But yeah, let's move on to the first real news item. AMD news. So first one, this is really quick. Uh, in addition to the DDR5 and near memory that I talked about a couple weeks ago in a news video, we also have information that AMD is trying to ship video cards with nine gigabit per second memory parts later this year. So I can't directly confirm it. My source uh, is very credible, so uh, I would believe it at this point. I'm not positive what that would be. I don't know if it maybe they're supposed to eventually make a smaller Vega 
discrete GPU. So I don't know if they'd use it for that or if they're sticking with HBM because they're ramping up their HBM production as well. Either way, though, keep an eye out for 9 gigabit per second AMD parts. Heard it here first, I guess. That'd be the memory they're, they're using. There's not much 9 gigabit per second GDDR5. Most of it's 8 gigabits per second. Some of it's 7. And NVIDIA, I think, is presently the only GPU maker that has some devices with 9 gigabit per second memory, uh, unless you go up to HBM2, which AMD is using, of course, on Vega. We also uh, currently are theorizing that AMD has higher core count Ryzen CPUs planned. So this came about in Buildzoid's video where Buildzoid speculated that the sheer power of the VRMs he's been looking at lately for X470 might be compensation for a future Ryzen part. And we kind of continued that when we did the VRM heatsink benchmark. If you haven't seen it, go to the channel. It's a Gigabyte X470 Gaming 7. We tested with the heatsink on versus off. And because it's got 40 amp power stages and 10 of them for a 10 plus 2 phase, it has absolutely no issues with thermals whatsoever, which we kind of think uh, might suggest that board vendors are preparing for higher core count CPU components in the future. Whether or not board vendors actually know that those are coming or they're just preparing for the possibility, I'm not sure, but that's uh, kind of our current in-house speculation on why the boards are relatively overkill for what they're powering with the Ryzen 2000 series. AMD also posted a big blog post about their Radeon branding. So they're planning to do Radeon exclusive brands in the future. This is kind of taking the GPP news in stride and they're basically trying to take a situation that they have been pretty vocal about indirectly or directly and create something good out of it by getting their own AMD exclusive branding for graphics cards as well. One of their statements in the content was pretty on the nose. It said, uh, quote, or they were offering, quote, the freedom to tell others in the industry that they won't be boxed into choosing proprietary solutions that come bundled with, quote, gamer taxes just to enjoy great experiences they should rightfully have access to. Uh, so very on the nose, AMD's clearly taken a jab at NVIDIA. I, I would like to point out that if you're going to say gamer taxes, maybe don't do the whole Vega thing and get free games for Vega that you're marketing to gamers and trying to cut miners out of it for an extra hundred dollars. It's not a free game, it's a hundred dollars. I know they pretty much killed that program, but if you're gonna talk trash, at least don't be guilty of the same thing yourself. I do understand where they're coming from though. AMD's trying to make light of a, a situation that they've been concerned about lately with GPP. So basically all you need to know is keep an eye out for new graphics card brand names coming out for future revisions, whatever those, maybe Vega or something else, but the board vendors are working with AMD to produce those. So keep an eye out for new branding. Now on memory suppliers making more money than ever, this is where, this story is pretty interesting and we're gonna dive into this more in a standalone video. But a couple of basics for you. If you're not familiar with how much money components cost, we previously had some pretty good information on memory prices for GDDR5, HBM2, HBM, stuff like that. We didn't have G5X. And that information was published in a content piece where we talked about how much does it cost to make Vega, the graphics card entirely. So we go over VRM cost, HBM memory, the, the actual memory, high bandwidth memory, the GPU itself, stuff like that. And uh, gave you some numbers there. Things have changed a lot since then because the memory market has been so crazy. And we also have some new numbers as well. So one thing, the fabs that are producing the wafers, $15 billion fabs for the super fabs they're called, where they're multi-story, and they uh, dice wafers and produce all of the memory chips that come out and eventually get sold to the manufacturers. Each wafer right now from our highly credible source produces something around $8,000 of profit per wafer. They can do something like 1,500 memory chips on average per wafer. And to give you an idea, let's say it's all just GDDR5. There are a lot of different chips that these SK Hynix, Micron, uh, Samsung, there are a lot of different types of chips they can put on a wafer, so the price will vary per wafer. But let's just look at memory alone for GDDR5. GDDR5 easily sells for $9 per chip right now uh, for 8 gigabit modules, 1 gigabyte modules. So if you buy 8 of them for your 8 gigabyte graphics card, you've already got a lot of cost in just the memory, and that's gone up a lot. So we already know that memory prices have gone up 20 to $30 for graphics cards with eight gigabytes of GDDR5 this year. And uh, $9 is the $9 easily for an eight gigabit price is what we were given. And 
then if you go to say HBM, you're spending multiples of nine dollars. OEMs like Dell, HP, folks like that, they could spend up to ten, eleven dollars per module because they're the graphics card vendors at least get better prices from what we've been told. So that's an upshot. But either way, the vendors, the suppliers here, Hynix, Micron, Samsung are making buckets of money right now and they claim they're out of clean room space. They claim that uh, they have shortages because of the high demand for other devices like cell phones. There's absolutely truth to a lot of that, but we also kind of question uh, exactly how true some of it is because memory companies have a history of dragging out these shortages as long as they can. Some of that has been proven legally and uh, profiting off of it. If you look at their stock charts again, it pretty much shows what's going on. Now, another thing here, if you're trying to, uh, I, I mentioned to this particular individual who works at one of the major suppliers that the current rumors in the industry for the past couple months have been pointing at originally 2018 for reduced memory prices. And the individual literally laughed at me and what I said and said, that's not going to happen for system memory specifically. And part of this is because margins on things like server memory are really high. They can be 60% margins on server memory, enterprise memories. So why would you target desktop consumers when you can make that kind of money selling to servers? That's where your desktop memory prices and alleged shortage come from. Just some interesting stuff for you all to think about. We'll have a separate thing on that later. Next up, Intel documents suggest eight core coffee-like SKUs. Reddit users have discovered technical documents on Intel's website alluding to Coffee Lake S parts with eight cores. Eight core Coffee Lake parts have been rumored for a while now, presumed to launch alongside the equally rumored and definitely does exist Z390 chipset. It's still unclear what form this chip would take, and the Intel documents paint more of a broad stroke. However, a SKU that could slot in just above the 8700K could give Intel an eight core mainstream option to dull the edge of AMD's recent Ryzen 2 launch, particularly the R7 2700 and 2700X. Next one, Antec launches the new DF500 case. All right, let's take a look at it, put it up on the screen. Okay, moving on. Next one, Google Fiber finally working well. I just wanted to plug this quickly. We ranted about Google Fiber and how awful their service was in our early months signing up with them, and it's finally functioning properly. So. We kind of got it working a couple months ago when I first posted the rant about it, and that's because they saw it, and they immediately responded by sending someone out to fix the Google Fiber implementation. So we got it all installed, but over the last couple of months, we were having some issues with upload times. I don't know if it was packet loss or what the deal was, but every now and then, we'd go from a 4K, maybe 8 gigabyte video, taking two to five minutes to upload, to just randomly taking two and a half hours which it would have been faster to upload on previous internet from another provider at that rate. So never figured out what the cause of that was, but I didn't want to post a follow-up and say, hey, it's working great now until that was fixed. I didn't bother the Google Fiber people, didn't really want to deal with the hassle, just kind of waited to see if it got fixed. It has been, and now we can upload large videos, upwards of eight to 12 gigabytes sometimes in minutes, literal minutes. Like I drag it over, and sit there and watch it for 30 seconds and it's 50% done. So it's pretty cool. I'm really happy to see that. Glad that it's working properly now. Hopefully uh, Google can kind of stay on top of it. Their service is supposed to be exceptional. We didn't have that experience originally, but they sent out uh, a, I guess, city manager for Google Fiber and made sure it got done properly when they came out the, the second time. And I was very happy with that level of service. So hopefully, Everyone can get that without having to complain publicly about it. But if you're thinking about Google Fiber, we do like it a lot now that it's functional. It was just a matter of getting it here uh, super fast. It's been consistent in upload uh, time requirement. Regardless of what time we upload, we get the fold down and up pretty much simultaneously. So we can pull Steam games down as fast as Steam will allow us. Like, I don't know, I think I've seen up to 80 megabytes per second and still push a video up the pipe as well and get that up within minutes. So uh, yeah, thank you Google Fiber for fixing it. Uh, hopefully anyone else, if you have issues, hopefully they will resolve it for you. I found tweeting at them worked the best. Next one, hardware news, CryoRig 
launches finally their full copper C7. First shot at Computex 2017, CryoRig is releasing their C7 CU, a full copper variant of the original C7, and that small form factor PCs. By using copper in lieu of aluminum, CryoRig touts a 15% increase in thermal performance. Moreover, using copper allowed CryoRig to increase thermal efficiency without adding size to the heatsink or increasing fan speed. We're not exactly 100% positive what they mean by a 15% increase in thermal performance. It's kind of a weird way to measure thermal performance, especially percentages if you're dealing with anything but Kelvin. But either way, uh, typically in our testing in the, in the ancient past, copper versus aluminum doesn't normally have a huge impact. But in something like a small form factor PC where you might be dealing with a really high ambient temperature, that's where it starts to matter because the... Uh, the difference is in a large case, copper versus aluminum with decent airflow conditions, you're pretty much at the same level of performance if all other factors are the same. But with a small form factor case, uh, the heat density is a lot higher in a really concentrated area, and we found that it can be beneficial there. We don't have any plans to review them presently, though. May or early June for release, targeted at $50 for the Cryrig Full Copper C7. Next up, EK will begin offering pre-built PCs under the new EK Fluid Gaming PC line. EK's angle is that not everyone has time to build their own PC. However, that pitch seems to be every boutique PC builder's approach, so not really that unique. More realistically, EK is attempting to carve out a niche audience in buyers that are apprehensive about selecting compatible liquid cooling parts and risking potential leaks. EK says they're offering systems with Ryzen 2000 series CPUs, NVIDIA GPUs, and then in-house EK solutions for cooling with an in-house version of the Inwin 101C chassis using custom paint. Configurable options include PSUs from EVGA, RAM from G-Skill, CableMod Pro Sleeves cable kits, AMD-based MSI motherboards, and storage options from Samsung and Seagate. $2,100 starting price for those for the lowest end configuration out of EK. And finally, a couple of hardware sales we spotted. We're going to try and start putting these at the end of the news videos again, like we did during the big sales at the end of the year. We noticed an LG, this mostly applies to the U.S., but go double check it, I guess. LG 32UD59-B, 32-inch 4K LED display. We actually, I think, have this exact one with AMD FreeSync for currently $445, which is a decent drop in price. And then EVGA's 450-watt BT PSU non-modular and it's 80 plus bronze. Nothing fancy at all about it. It's just dirt cheap. It's $25 right now. So this is a power supply I wouldn't necessarily, I absolutely would not recommend it for anything remotely high end or mid range. But if you're kind of going the cheap bastard approach of not spending any money unless where you absolutely have to, it's an okay power supply for something like an APU build or a low end DGPU and CPU build. So something worth considering if you're really scraping the bottom of the barrel for budget because it's one of the better power supplies in terms of things that are $24 or whatever it is. And that's all for this time. Subscribe for more as always. Go to patreon.com slash gamersnexus. Help us out directly. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to pick up one of our mod mats. And I'll see you all next time.